Hi everyone, I'm Jack for Emling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share a few thoughts on Lucky Breaks by Yevgenia Belarusets. This is a very important book. It's a very timely book. Belarusets is Ukrainian, and the linked stories that make up Lucky Breaks focus on the lives of women in Eastern Ukraine, and they were written roughly between 2014 and 2018, as Russia was ramping up an undeclared war in Eastern Ukraine in the Donbas region. And Belarusets is a photographer originally. And there's an element of the stories that, that seems to be almost like fictionalized reportage. They're, 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 their stories are often short. Uh, there, there's a sort of reportage about them, the, the type of thing we would see in traditional newspaper articles uh, when those were in print. Um, but Belarusets also has this beautiful sense of humor, this sense of irony, uh, this sense of wonder, because she's not um, emphasized uh, emphasizing the, the combat lines and. The, the way that the militaries are operating or their partisans are operating there in the Donbas region. Rather, she's focused on women and the women in the different cities and the different villages. How are their lives changing? How are people who have been displaced by this invasion uh, and, and have moved to Kiev, how have their lives changed? Are, are they able to find a comparable job or do they have to now work at cleaning floors? And they're so uncomfortable by it that they, they, they're they asked to clean floors at night so that no one will see their discomfort. Um, and there's a there's a real uh, sense of pathos that she achieves in so many of these stories um, and a beautiful humanity that she wants to emphasize in so many of these stories. Of, of course, Lucky Breaks is, is significantly more timely in the past year as the, that undeclared war in the Donbass region turned into a full-scale illegal invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, Belarusets really uh, accomplished something special here in Lucky Breaks. I wanted to share a few uh, readings from this. In one, uh, there's a, a group of people in a building who, as different bombings have occurred, have, have decided that perhaps the horoscope is the way that will allow them to know when it might be safe. The days drag on with no meaning. It's really quiet in A where we live. Nobody shoots at anybody. Nobody asks for explanations for no reason. Roadblocks don't work the way they do at B. Here, you can drive through a roadblock un uh, unmolested, especially if you are taking a jitney bus or taxi. I don't orient myself well in the city where I've spent my whole life. I don't understand who these people are, the ones I consider my friends, the ones I get together with every Thursday to play cards for small change while consuming a mountain of cookies and candy. What scares me most is stability. There's a quiet but an unsteady kind of quiet, giving way like a bog or a swamp. That's it, a swamp, not a soul around. I'm searching for my husband in the forest in the middle of water, knee deep. Did this happen to me or did none of it happen? You're going to laugh. It happened not to me, but my neighbor. For some reason, I always find myself in her place when I tell her story. And she goes on to share. We laughed at our neighbor, at her inability to sit still. Then the neighbor showed us a page from the paper, the town news, and there was a horoscope printed there for each day. Some signs were given hour by hour. It turned out that Pisces could be sure of their well-being and safety from 3 to 5 p.m. that day. And so my neighbor, a pure Pisces without any additions, could easily leave the basement. There might be rumbling somewhere up above, but nothing would touch her, almost for certain. Pisces kept Victoria company and they had a good time together. Everything felt surprising to me that day. And I even believed the rumors that it was Canada that was waging war against us over the discovery of new deposits of valuable coal. Some of us were already deeply convinced of the fact we sat in the basement thinking about Canadian aggression, about how greedy, vindictive, and heartless other countries could be. Those bombs are made in Canada, the whisper swirled around the cellar, and for some reason we found it comforting. We all started to study the horoscope. Scorpio was safe tomorrow, from noon until almost evening. That was how I went for my first stroll. I walked around a city where that was both smoky and bright. The streets were empty. The windows had no glass. The ground seemed to tremble a little, while the thin trees curled down under the weight of their leaves. We've never had such quiet before. And... It's strange. It's uh, it's very disconcerting. It's but it's also very real. It's uh, the the sense to try and find community. They have a neighbor who can't sit still and just wants to keep walking around and needs to talk to somebody. And so they try to find ways where different people can sort of keep her company and and walk around with her. Um, and so the, the, there is something um, really quite incredible in many many of these stories. Another one I want to just read the ending because it, it gets a, it hints at the poetic realism that uh, Belarusets, as this is her first fiction book, her first series of stories, is she's capable of as a writer. She notes, sometimes we manage to sweep the yard, clean up the kitchen, go to work, and we think that we have broken loose into freedom. But no, 
The flowers in the courtyard have wilted. The flower beds have been ravaged by cars. The children are covered in dirt. The bushes refuse to bloom. There's an enormous mitt sticking out from the black hole of a window. Maria Iliknina is getting ready for work. And the very next story has this incredible moment where a woman who has been there and she's she's, she's been shopping uh, and suddenly just realizes she can't walk anymore and she just goes and sits down and doesn't get up. And how do the different people uh, interact around her? There's something that's very Kafkaesque about it. Uh, it, it. Explicitly, it recalls Gogol himself, someone who had written stories set there in Ukraine um, earlier in his career. And so, so those recollections uh, are, are both magical and yet devastating at the same time. But one last passage I'd like to share. Uh, while uh, Belarus says periodically shows herself sort of as an interviewer talking to women, at other times she casts herself in this first person I. And so here she's imagining this other person giving this sort of speech. What I still need to do is identify the problem, the question, the excruciating doubt that overshadows the brilliant audit I've made of my life. This question may upset or embarrass some of you, but I have no desire to awaken your conscience, which must be sleeping at the moment like an innocent child. Rather, I need your collective mind for the solution of the dilemma of my entire life, a solution likely to be the guiding star of my future development. What is it like to be a successful person, the most successful person, in a city populated by losers? My voice is breaking. I'd like to scream, but in my social position, this would be inappropriate, to say the least. Looking around you now, where did all of this come from? Underslept children in kindergartens with roofs fallen in, the old repainted monument to Marx that they tried to topple for over a week, potholes and cracked asphalt in the streets, cheated investors, a closed theater, and alcoholic actresses. I'm listening for your answers. Yes, I'm listening, listening, even though it's a completely useless exercise. The loser will never say anything. He'll always lift up his eyes full of chilling rebuke and cut you to the quick or else he'll shrug in perplexity. At best, your success doesn't concern him. Indifference, the scourge of our time, our society. Uh, and so there, there, there's a power she conjures as well in some of these characters, and a power that these human lives have retained despite the horrors they've suffered, despite the, the absolute devastation that had occurred in, in that region in these stories and even now. Uh, and so, it, as I said, it's a very timely book. If, if you can find this at your library, uh, if you see his copy, I, I really would encourage everybody to, to pick this one up, read it, um, and from there, look for, for more reportage around what's going on. Um, I hope that uh, we get more from Belarus and more from, from writers like her who are, who are able to share these experiences in such an authentic and, and personal and powerful way. Uh, as I had mentioned, I was reminded of a number of different writers. I had mentioned Gogol, who explicitly has many of his early stories are sort of set in rural parts of Ukraine. Uh, another one would be Isaac Babel. Uh, both were writers under the Russian Empire, but, but have heritage in Ukraine. Um, Babel's early stories, many of those are set in Odessa. He, his later stories, the famous Red Cavalry Cycle, is set during the um, Polish and Russian War. But the, the stories set in Odessa are, are just as fantastic and wonderful. Um, within uh, the sense of real life and and sort of um, poetic realism sort of fusing in fiction, I thought of the great Dead Girls by Selva Almada. This feels even you know just as close to real life. Both of, both um, Belarusets and Almada are drawing on very personal experiences, contextualizing uh, what what they're seeing in terms of, of violence and how it relates specifically to women in a very important way. Um, so this was one that I was reminded of. Uh, aspects of the way that um, the different industrial centers and how those have shifted are uh, shared and the way that Belarus draws on the the ways she had photographed those and also photographed like, coal mines um, recalls some of the works of I would say Laszlo Krasno Horkai especially his earlier works that show Hungary at the end of sort of what we think of as the Eastern Bloc uh, like Sit and Tango or perhaps the Melancholy of Resistance. The deep um, ironies that Belarus conjures remind me of the great stories by Leonard Michaels. I would say especially his early collections, Going Places, and I would have saved her if I could. Um, there's a way in which uh, the stories 
in Lucky Breaks reminded me of what James Agee did in Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, uh, particularly the fact that she includes a number of the photographs she's taken of real Ukrainians. Uh, and we even see some of the men wearing um, like military fatigues or, or seeing people smiling and, and sort of trying to force a smile, but, but in a later picture, perhaps showing it a, a slightly more authentic, relaxed smile. Um, but Let Us Now Praise Famous Men is probably Agee's best work, I would say. Additionally, the stories of Isaac Bevsheva Singer, uh, his early stories that are set in the uh, rural parts of Poland under the Russian Empire over 100 years ago, th that sense of, of um, I don't want to say magical realism, but, but being willing to look at, at, at reality from, from a viewpoint that allows something special and strange to occur and just feel normal, to feel like uh, almost faded and inevitable is something that uh, Singer was wonderful at. And then finally, that deep, dangerous you know, paranoia that, that's not paranoia because it is real, the danger is real, uh, brought to mind the great President's Room by Ricardo Romero, which I read last year. So let me know if you've read any of uh, this book or any other writers from Ukraine, particularly more contemporary ones. That's something I've been trying to pay attention to certainly over the past year. Um, but even across the past half decade. So I hope everybody's doing well and thank you.